Oh, also I didn't uh, mention too, another person to be praying for is, uh, most of you know, uh, Barb Plumley. Uh, you know, comes when she can. Uh, she was in the hospital this past week, just wanted us to uh, remember her, to keep praying for her. Uh, she struggles with various uh, issues as well. But yeah, to pray for Barb. Okay. Well, we started a uh, new uh, series last week and uh, kind of using a lot of last week to kind of explain it. And so we're going to continue on with that. And uh, if you notice, there's some message notes. If you want to follow along on that, that'd be fine. That entitled uh, today, anyway, in the beginning. Uh, I came across this. I thought I'd share this. Uh, the top ten reasons uh, why God made Eve. Okay, remember Adam and Eve. Okay. Uh, one, God worried that Adam would always be lost in the garden because men hate to ask for directions. So to ask Eve. God knew that Adam would one day need someone to hand him the TV remote. Uh, God knew that Adam would never buy a new fig leaf when his wore out and would therefore need Eve to get a new one for him. God knew that Adam would never make a doctor's appointment for himself. God knew that Adam would never remember which night was garbage night. God knew that if the world was to be populated, men would never be able to handle childbearing. Uh, as keeper of the garden, Adam would never remember where he put his tools. Or eight, uh, God knew that Adam would very, very shortly would need someone to blame his problems on. Uh, nine, as the Bible says, it's not good for man to be alone. And ten, when God finished the creation of Adam, he stepped back, scratched his head and said, I can do better than that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Enough on that. But yeah, in the beginning, let's begin with uh, reading just a, actually just a couple of verses. Genesis 1 1 says, In the beginning, I know the World Series is going on. That's not the beginning of baseball there in the, in the big inning. It's in the beginning. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for your word, and thank you that we can study it, and you gave us minds to understand it, and to apply it, and to share it with others, and help us to do that throughout this uh, new week, as we apply it first to ourselves, and then share it with others, because it's good news. And so I pray you bless our time together as we look into your word in this tremendous subject. And I pray you give us wisdom and insight and, and to understanding it and to applying it by your spirit, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we can ask that question, how did everything come to be? You know, some people believe in, a, you know, in the Big Bang, that there is this pinpoint of energy that... Uh, somehow, you know, mysteriously appeared. We have no idea, you know, no one knows where that came from. Just somehow they say it was there, came out of nowhere, and that it exploded like a massive bomb going off. Usually when bombs go off, it, you know, it destroys things. But somehow this, contrary to every physical law we know, somehow created things, created the universe and an extremely complex universe. So much so that our brains, our best supercomputers, even all tied together, could not invent these things or create these things, but somehow this inanimate object did. There's others who recognize that uh, uh, all the physical and logical problems with that, and so they say, well, you know, that's uh, uh, space, where did we come from? You know, space aliens, you know, they created life, and, and it doesn't, that doesn't solve anything, and no one ventures, well, where did they, you know, where did they come from, and who made them? Um, so we have, uh, however, uh, in fact, we have, uh, oh yeah, there's, yikes. But how about the next, uh, the next slide over? Let's see, what's the next one? All right, one more. Where we have the, uh, I think we have, uh, keep going another one. There's a, yep, that one. I'm glad this is true. I don't know if you can read it. I'll read it. Once it got blown up, I see it gets kind of uh, blurry. It says, so two car crashes, you got one guy with the Jesus bumper sticker, and he says, thank God I'm still alive. The other guy's got a Darwin sticker on. He says, 
Whew, thanks to the impersonal forces of blind chance that brought the universe and all life into its existence, I'm still alive. Um, I'm glad that we can thank the Lord for uh, things, not just blind chance, which is nothing anyway. Chance is just a mathematical concept. Chance is nothing. It's no thing. It can't do anything. Uh, but anyway, we have a book that claims to be a, an uh, eyewitness testimony from the only one who is actually there. Think of that. Don't discount that. We have an actual eyewitness of what happened. And he wrote it down for us. And we have that in the book, the Bible, and, uh, which says that creation was the direct result of our creator, whom we call God. In fact, I think we got another slide. What's the next one after that? Um, not a, yeah, let there be truth. Here a guy says, the best evidence for the amount of time used to make something comes from the testimony of the one who made it. Like this guy who painted a picture. He says, and we ask him, well, how long did it take you to make that? Well, I did it in six days. And others will say, you know, except when it comes to the works of God. Some say, this is the best evidence for a young earth, a skull. No, this is the best evidence, you know, fossils. No, this is the best, our DNA. But the best evidence is, those are evidences, but the best evidence is the testimony of the eyewitness who was there, who says in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth. Again, that just can't be discounted. All right. And that's why, uh, uh, you know, Genesis being the very first part of the Bible, it contains 50 chapters of amazing history. Like I said last week, why do we call, we say, you know what, let's read a Bible story today. You know, it's like, we're going to read the story of Adam and Eve. And it's like, that's a story. Like Paul Bunyan is a story. Well, it is a story, but it's more than that too. It's actual history. So we could say, well, let's read what actually happened in history when we read this. All right. Uh, you know, and Genesis uh, tells us how the world came to be. But you know what? It also explains many, many other things. That's, uh, uh, these things are exciting too. For example, how mankind was given dominion over the earth, how, um, why marriage exists, uh, why, uh, you know, how, how God created the world in six days, why we have a seven-day week, why it's not a five-day week, how come it's not an eight-day week? I think some years back in the 70s or 80s, the Russians tried to say, we're not going to go with that, we're going to have an eight-day week. They tried it for a few years, it was just catastrophic. They immediately dropped and they had to go back to a seven-day week. Well, why do we even have a seven-day week? Where'd that come from? Genesis explains all that. Why is it we can even use as humans logic, reasoning, and are able even to understand truth? Where did that come from, that ability? Uh, it even explains why we wear clothes. So, I mean, praise God for Genesis. Praise God for clothes, too. Well, we'd freeze up here in Minnesota. But that Genesis explains all these things. You know, and there are many good reasons uh, to believe in God, and I'm not going to go into all the proofs there are for God's existence. You know, you got the ontological proofs and teleological proofs and the uh, uh, moral proofs, and you got, you know, other, other types of uh, proofs. And uh, I'm not going to go into those, but let me uh, say a couple of things ab about those uh, types of proofs for God. Uh, four observations, actually. But you know, this works both ways. People say, well, show me proof for God. Okay, yeah, we can do that, but uh, we can give these various kinds of proofs, but also give me proof why God does not exist. Come on, you gotta give me proof too, and there's no proof, no one's ever offered a proof that God does not exist. And so, you know, again, it works both ways. Uh, before observations about some of these, one, you know, nowhere in the Bible does it give an argument for God's existence. It just assumes he is. In the beginning, God created these things. And, you know, the, the Bible almost thinks, you know, arguments for God's existence are unreasonable, illogical. It just assumes God is. It assumes that people will, just like, don't need to because it assumes people will, will know there is a God from what has been made. They look at creation and that should be reason enough. <clears throat> Our second observation about these uh, types of proofs is that they do have value and that they are able to affirm the belief of those who already believe. And that's, that has value that way. They also have value for unbelievers to show that 
belief in God is not contrary to reason. Now, just these types of proofs for God will not make somebody a Christian all by themselves because they still have to hear the gospel of how they can. But they do help break down certain mental barriers that some people like to put up. And then a fourth uh, observation about some of these is that the best place to look really is at the life and death and resurrection of Christ. Because you just can't get away from the mountains of historical evidence that back up his life and his death and his resurrection. I'm um, going to take my, my own experience as an example with that. Uh, I became a Christian when I was uh, 18. And uh, if they had told me that at that point that I had to uh, believe that God created everything and that evolution was false, I don't know if I would have become a Christian. But they, they told me about Jesus, his life, his sinless life, what he did, and uh, his miracles, and his resurrection, and that, that I've... I'm a sinner, and that creates a problem. God's holy, and, and I needed to be rescued from that spot, that position. And Jesus is the only Savior there is, and that's why he came. And one of the reason, primary reason he came. And, and so I thought, yes, that's, I wanted that, so I, I put my faith in Christ. And then as I began to grow as a Christian, I began to see that God's Word, well, you know, it really can be trusted. I mean, it's really accurate. It's really helpful. It's right on. And then it, after a while, I began to think, you know what? If God's word is accurate about all everything else, maybe it's accurate too about how things began in the, about creation. And so I thought, yeah, I think I can trust it there too, that God is the creator. And then since then, I have found how good science will back up the Bible's claims on that as well. I will never cede for a moment that the creation view is less scientific than any other view. All the good science, I think, backs up creation. Anyway, that's another story, issue. Uh, let's see, I think we have another one. That's a, yeah, this one. I'll read it here again. It says, uh, one guy saying, why don't you gentlemen take the Bible literally? You are theologians, aren't you? We can't take the Bible literally. It's written by men. Of course, so are all science books, everything else too. But anyway, but he goes on, he says, men inspired by God. And then he says, well, whatever. The reliable facts are written by scientists. And then the other guy's poking him on the shoulder, says, oh, wait a minute. Uh, you're using last year's science book. This one has all the new facts. And then he tosses his old one over. He said, oh, as I was saying, the reliable facts are written by scientists. And True science, good science is always asking tough questions, good questions, always following the evidence where it leads, wherever it leads. And we're constantly discovering new things. Um, anyway, I'd, I'd like that little uh, cartoon on there. So, uh, good. Again, what we're doing in this new series is that we're looking and going to give kind of a simple framework for understanding the Bible and our world and the why it is the way that it is. And we talked a lot about that uh, last week. But anyway, it's because so, so many people have bits and pieces of the Bible, They're a little bit here, a little bit there, and they don't have a framework to hang all these pieces on and how to make it fit a coherent uh, system or strategy or way of looking at things. And so one way, you know, they don't have a, a simple and clear picture or idea of the big picture. And one way that I want to do that is, rather than inventing my own, I came across this and I wanted to use it. It's from Answers in Genesis, where they've come up with the seven C's of history. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to run with that. And what that does is it gives us a, a simple framework for looking at the major events of world history from a biblical perspective. Yeah, you can leave that one up then. Okay. So let's uh, get a little more started here. Point one, it says, the first week that ever existed. Does that title uh, heading surprise you? Um, you know, Genesis states that God made everything by the power of his word. And then the Bible summarizes what he did on each day. And so on day one, it says God created, one of the things he would have created would have been time. I mean, try to wrap your heads around that one. How can that be? I mean, God is timeless. And uh, for him to even create that. And it says, 
that he created, uh, you know, so it would have been the very first week in that sense. I mean, he created space, he created earth, he says he created light, he separated the light from darkness on that first day. So he made morning and evening, the very first day. And personally, I, I personally believe that it was, I think clearly, I think a 24 hour day. I think six literal days. Uh, personally, I think God could have taken millions of years to do this. Uh, I also think God could have done it like that in a split second. You didn't even need a whole day to do this. But our eyewitness testimony says he did it in one day. So that's what I'm going to go with. And I know some of you might be having lots of questions about lots of things, but that's we'll, we'll move through here rather quickly. Um, day two, it says God separated the water by an expanse. So you have waters above the expanse, waters below the expanse. And there you have another day. Day three, it says he gathered the waters under the expanse and thus making dry land appear. And so that's where, uh, in fact, in Job 38, it says the angels rejoiced, sang for joy when God laid the foundations of the earth. Wouldn't that have been neat to be there and see that and hear that? But then it says on that day, day three, he made the plants, he made the trees, uh, he gave them, you know, a seed so that they could reproduce after their kind, which means, um, you know, that an oak tree was able to go out and produce all kinds of oak trees, a great variety of oak trees, uh, depending upon its environment and so on. But never ever has an oak tree ever produced an evergreen tree. It just hasn't. It's not in it. Can't do it. Um, it's reproduced after its kind. Uh, day four it says uh, God created these ongoing sources of light. You know, before it was just light in general. You know, in other places it says, you know, God is light. So I'm not sure just how he did that. There was light. But then he organizes that light into the sun and the stars. And you have the moon reflecting it at, for at night. So it says he made that. So that would, of course, create, you know, photosynthesis and heat and the whole water cycle that's going on. And and then uh, and the sun, you mean, you think of the sun, how that's just this, uh, you know, they say th it's like thousands of hydrogen bombs going off continually. And it speaks again of the power of God to do that, which was an easy thing for him to do. And, and then you see all the stars, and we're continually discovering new stars. I mean, it's just fantastic. And it's you know, just beyond our comprehension, all what God has made. And then on day five, it says he created uh, winged creatures of every kind, fish to fill the sea. Uh, and he told them to reproduce after their kind. So on that day, he made the birds and fish. And then on day six, he first created the land animals. You know, you have horses, cats, dogs, elephants, you know, tigers, uh, creatures that would one day grow into dinosaurs. Uh, let me say something about that. You remember how in the beginning, things, it was perfect, and how people lived a long, long time. And they were designed originally to live a long time. And it was it Methuselah? Was he lived the oldest guy, 965 years? And so not only the people, but the animals living a long time. Now you have people, you know, we, at a certain age, we stop growing, don't we? At least upward. Sometimes we grow in other directions. But, you know, we, uh, uh, we stop growing at a certain age. And most animals do. However, certain reptiles never stop growing their whole life. They just keep growing and growing and growing as long as they are alive. Imagine back then when they, they live for hundreds of years, let's say, imagine some of these reptiles, how big they could get. I mean, huge, like dinosaurs, yeah. So, um, again, lots more could be said on that. And it says, you know, on that sixth day, it told, God told the animals to reproduce after their kind. Let me just say something briefly on that too. You know, the Bible uh, teaches what some call today now, um, microevolution, if you want to call it that. Uh, we have no problem with that. that. That's exactly what the Bible talks about when it says rep reproducing after its kind. What that means is like we can take a dog, breed it with another kind of dog, and get a whole other kind of dog, but in every case it's always another dog. They have tried to breed dogs with other animals. It has never worked. But they... Uh, and so, the, you know, the great variety of dogs that we have, this is what the Bible means, reproduce after its kind. And we know that people and animals will adapt to their environment. That's the way God designed us. Think of it 
Uh, another way to think of it is look at people. I mean, uh, uh, look at all the different skin tones there are, all the different heights of people, sizes, uh, you know, hair colors, I mean, eye color, I mean, all, so, such a tremendous variety. You look at all the people around the planet, and yet they all came from Adam and Eve. And so, so that's what the Bible's talking about, reproducing after its kind. That's, think what that does too, that's a whole other subject, but interesting how with, um, uh, you know, racism, you know, there's only one race, that's the human race. And, you know, there's different cultures, but one race. All right. Yeah, let us know if we can help in some way, and yeah, thanks for helping. All right, but that's, uh, so again, that's, you know, so often when evolutionists debate, they've given us examples of microevolution, how this bird adapted to its environment and it changed colors and so on. Of course, that's what the Bible says would happen. Uh, what we don't believe is macroevolution, you know, where fish give birth to birds, you know, or mice give birth to cats, you know, cross species like that, no. In fact, we, we uh, so I, you know, we, um, we still don't, and we, we don't have any proof of that happening. They're, they're desperately looking for them, you know, these transitionary forms. And if that actually occurred, there should be transitionary forms just everywhere. I mean, we should just found tons and tons of these things. They should be everywhere. Even my uh, geology professor in college, who was a staunch evolutionist, he admitted, he said, yeah, we don't have any true evolu you know, transitionary forms yet, but give us time, we'll find them. I mean, he even admitted we don't have any. And that's, so again, we had the Bible saying they will reproduce after their kind, but not turn into a new kind, but different, uh, like I'd mentioned about the dogs. And then we get into a point two, it says God creates marriage. Uh, you know, also on day six, it says God took, you know, from the dust of the ground and uh, he formed it into, uh, first, a, a male body, but it was lifeless, it was just lying there. And so God had to, remember, breathe the story, breathe into it and gave it a life-giving spirit or soul. And so people, that's, if you wonder what people are like, they are, you know, body and soul. You know, atheists say, no, you have, there's just a body, there's no soul. Uh, no, they're wrong. And God says, you know, body and soul. And your body will one day die, we know that. But your soul, which is the real you, that's your likes, your dislikes, your personality, that will live on forever. So body and soul, he made us, which is good. And uh, remember Adam and all of creation, it was perfect back then at this time. I mean, there was no corruption, no sin, no sickness, no death. There were no pre-mankind creatures that lived for millions of years before Adam and Eve, you know, and thus dying all the time because there was no death yet. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to say more on that too, but let's go on. And God made a special place for Adam to live, you know, there in the Garden of Eden. He put him in there and he was supposed to work it. He was supposed to watch over it which shows that work was part of the good creation of God. We weren't meant just to sit around and you know, drink coffee all day. You know, we were meant to work. Now, work is a good thing. Um, it's, it's like that Minnesota explorer, Will Steger once said, he said, you know, these bodies were meant to move. They are, they're meant to be on the goal. Anyway, work's a good thing. And then, uh, uh, and then he gave Adam some very gracious offers. He said, look, you can eat whatever you want. There's, probably hundreds of choices he had, this tree, that, whatever. And, you know, Adam, you choose, you know, use your free will, choose, decide, whatever you want for lunch, it's up to you. Just don't eat of that tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. If you do, you'll die. But everything else, man, it's just wide open for you, Adam. Choose whatever you like. I mean, what a great opportunity he was, in the situation he was in. And then after uh, creating Adam, God declared it's not good for man to be alone. He needed a partner. Uh, someone that he could then reproduce with after his kind, like everything else. And so God gave Adam the task of naming the animals. Now it says that he didn't, not necessarily that he finished that task on that day, but he started it and did enough so to where it made Adam become aware that as he saw these animals come, they all had mates, but Adam didn't. So he wasn't aware of his need at first. God knew his need. And now God was starting to make Adam 
This is a process he was using to make Adam become aware of his need. And I think that's really encouraging because no matter what you may face, God's aware of your needs before you even know you have that need. And think of it, even in this new week, you may have things come up, needs that may arise in this next week, even certain problems or whatever, that you're not even, you know, we're not even aware of yet, but God's already not only aware of it, but he's already at work probably yesterday and today getting things ready to meet that need. That's just, that's just so cool how God does that. And he was doing that with Adam. Adam wasn't aware of his need. God made him aware of it, that he too needed somebody, uh, a partner. And so God uh, used, uh, as he was naming the animals, he became aware of his need. And, uh, you know, God's always promised to meet our needs. Not all our wants, not all our luxuries, uh, but all our needs. And isn't that really what we really want anyway? I mean, think about it, how when God made the fish, you know, I mean, he was smart. He didn't say, you know, he didn't make the fish first and say, okay, now you flop around on the ground a little bit, you know, and try to breathe while I quick make some water for you. No, he made the water first and then the fish. Uh, so it's just, you know, brilliant. It's just a, how God was doing all this. And so again, and then what did he do next? Well, we know the story. He made Adam sleep. And he uh, took one of his ribs and fashioned a uh, woman out of that. Some have said, have noticed, you know, God didn't use, let's say, a piece of his skull uh, to, so that the woman would be over him. He didn't use a piece of Adam's foot so that, like, the woman would be under him. He used a part of one of his ribs so that she would be alongside him. Not over him, not under him, alongside. I think that's a good picture. And then what did Adam say? After God created Eve, you know, boring, you know, quit nagging me, um, you know, leave me alone. I wish somebody would invent a TV, um, you know, get my supper. No, he didn't say any of those things. You know, when you read here in Genesis 2, 23, I love what he says. He says, this, you know, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of man. I mean, he, this whole verse is like a giant exclamation point. And he's saying, wow, when he first lays eyes on Eve, wow, this is fantastic. He was delighted, he was excited, this is beautiful. And so, I, I mean, just a tremendous response that he had. He was, thought it was fantastic. And then he goes on with his job. He'd been all day naming animals. Now he names her. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. So what you have there, you have a picture of the first marriage. And uh, I want to point out, I think that whole story is very rich in meaning for, uh, for marriage, about what God intended decisively, purposely, uh, for uh, marriage to be about. One man, one woman, uh, not two or three people, not four people, not polygamy, not Adam and Bob, one man, one woman, uh, who can become one flesh, and can reproduce after their kind. Um, and shortly after this, he tells them to have, you know, dominion over the earth, uh, he, you know, which means, you know, don't destroy it, but care for it, use it, uh, develop it. Uh, that's where science comes in. Uh, look at all the things you can discover and what God has created to create all kinds of helpful things, whether it's medicines or whatever. And uh, then he tells them to be fruitful and multiply, you know, probably the one command that mankind's never broken. Is they've been good on that one. And by the way, that command has never been rescinded either. Uh, be fruitful and multiply. It's still there. But, you know, also, a, uh, I think, a very powerful point on this, and that is that Jesus himself reinforces that this is the way it was uh, when in his, some of his comments. When he, you know, in Matthew 19, he talks about uh, some of these same things. Uh, and I think Jesus knew what he was talking about. Um, and I, so let's be clear on this. Uh, I think it's important to bring this out. That if someone says today, no, that's not how it happened, uh, what they are also saying at the same time, and they cannot avoid it, and that is they're saying, Jesus is wrong. Uh, you know, that, so if they say, don't believe that, believe me about how everything got started, even though I don't know I wasn't there, I'm, never, I'm just you know, going on hearsay, but I, uh, 
uh, believe me, don't believe Jesus because they're saying two different things. So somebody's wrong. And so let's be clear on that, that that is what's going on. You know, someone says, you know, no, I don't believe that. Because that's, what I'm giving here is that the, as we're looking at part of this series, uh, the biblical view of things. Not everyone will buy that, but at least we need to know, I buy it totally. Uh, I didn't initially, like I said, as I grew to trust Christ and as his word was accurate, I came to believe, accept the whole thing. And I think there's, we have real good evidence for doing so. But again, let's be clear on that. Some will say, well, but Jesus is just a Middle Easterner, lived 2,000 years ago, you know, we've learned so much more since then. Well, that'd be true if, for your typical Middle Easterner, but Jesus wasn't just a typical Middle Easterner. He was God in the flesh. So, and so he reinforces all this, this whole creation account and how God intended marriage to be. So that's a really, really powerful point. So if someone says there's something else, you're, okay, you're entitled to your opinion, but you're asking me, should I believe you? Or let's see, should I believe Jesus? Mm, tough choice. Yeah, I'm gonna go with Jesus. So that also is what's going on here. Then uh, that goes on, uh, on the seventh day, it says God rested. And I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Uh, you know, I heard someone say, why did God create Adam first? And so he could have a chance to, you know, finally get a chance to say something. Uh, but, you know, those who know me know that I'm usually pretty hard on the men. I'm usually easy on the women, uh, but I'm usually hard on the men. And actually the reason for that is really simple. It's because my wife's out there listening and I, I really want to have supper tonight, so I, I have to. All right. Uh, in Genesis 2, uh, verse 24, it talks about the man shall leave his father and his mother, hold, hold fast to his wife, they shall become one flesh. And here, you know, God's just talking about physical intimacy and marriage. And, you know, I don't think as people we should not be ashamed to talk about that which God was very glad to create. He created this gladly, joyfully, it's beautiful. Uh, physical intimacy in marriage is a good thing, it's a beautiful thing, it's the right thing. Remember after God created all this, and he said, what did he say, his point of it? It's, it's all, it was very good. He didn't say, okay, get married, but don't enjoy it. You know, no, he said it was all very good. And so that applies to all those things. So, you know, I, um, um, Maybe I'll just say a further word on that. One of the things we see is that since we live in such a uh, culture that has so many different ideas on this, but it shows that physical intimacy within marriage is right and is very good within the boundaries that God has set for it, which is within the guidelines of a biblical marriage. I can't just say marriage anymore because God clearly has shown us what he intended marriage to be and of course, the government today has comes up with all kinds of definitions for what marriage is. And uh, so I have to say a biblical marriage, uh, uh, sex within a biblical marriage is a very good thing, a beautiful thing, a right thing. But outside of those boundaries is when it becomes very dehumanizing, very abusive, very cheap. It's kind of like a river. You know, you have a river that as long as it's within its banks, its borders, its boundaries, it's a great thing, it's, if we like it, if it's useful, or, you know, but it's when a river floods over its borders that it becomes very destructive. So it's not a perfect illustration, but it kind of applies. All right, so it says, uh, God made a man and woman in his image. And uh, back in chapter one, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. And what does that mean? Uh, let me just, just quickly mention what that means. I mean, uh, whole books have been written about that. And the implications of it are just awesome. But just three things real quickly. One, having the, the fact that we are made in the image of God means that we have a rational nature, means we are able to, we can think, we can ponder, we can uh, create things. Look at the stuff man has created. You know, these computers and rockets, and no animals even coming close. They have a very rudimentary, you know, brain. Uh, they too can, you know, think to some degree, but nothing like what a man can do. He's a rational nature. He has a moral nature. Uh, you know, look at all the emotions we feel. And even some dogs, our dog could feel some emotions, you know, shame and guilty and so on. But uh, 
but a moral nature in that we can uh, ponder uh, things, whether this is moral or immoral. Is this good or is this bad? You know, no bear going out killing a rabbit then stops and ponder, hmm, did, did I just do a bad thing? You know, it, it of course doesn't cross his mind. He doesn't have a moral nature. It just is God-given instincts. Uh, and so we have a rational nature, we have this moral nature, we have a regal nature. And by that I mean that the fact that God created us to have dominion over the earth, he created us to rule with him. Uh, even like it says, one day we'll reign with him. That's all part of that regal nature that he gave. He didn't give that to any animal. That was just to mankind. So that's three things that the image of God means. We have a rational nature, a moral nature, and a regal nature. And thus man, he's not an animal, he's not an angel, but mankind made up, you know, male and female are the, you know, God's most special creation. And together they make up, you know, the image of God. No animal can claim that. Uh, and then, of course, and at the end of day six, um, God, again, he looked over everything that he had made. And uh, as I said earlier, this, you know, this very insightful proclamation that he made, he said it was all very good. Um, there was no sin. Think of that. No sin. There's no death. Nothing. Nobody had died before that. Uh, there was no sicknesses, no thorns. Everything was perfect. Nowadays, uh, something that's perfect is in perfect things are pretty hard to come by. Who in here has a perfect marriage? Now, I know some of you men know what, how you're supposed to answer that. And if you didn't, you might have got an elbow in the rib cage. But still, uh, back then, everything was perfect. And so that's good to remember. And, and this too, all were vegetarians back then too. Uh, remember it says uh, he gave them to eat of all the plants and, and so on, even the animals. No animals were eating other animals. I mean, it was perfect. There was no death. No animals were dying either yet. And does that mean we have to be vegetarians? Well, remember in Genesis 9, 3, I think, after the flood, God says, okay, he's changed the rules. He said, okay, now you can eat meat. You can, yeah, you can still eat plants, but you can also eat from every moving thing. So I'll just say that. Then on the seventh day, it says God rested. He blessed the seventh day. Again, we see the creation of the seven-day work week. To work six days, one day off, something different from your regular work. And so this morning, I see our time's up. You know, we looked at just that first C. If we were talking about the seven C's of history, that first C was creation. And so we talked really, really quickly about that. But, and we saw again, I mean, this, this is incredible. This is our history. And it explains so many things, so things that I brought up as we went through this, a number of things. And Genesis and our creation explains that. So we covered a lot of ground today. But we're going to stop there. Uh, we'll continue on next week. Uh, we'll see what happens next. Or actually, we'll go on to the next uh, C in the seven C's and about what happens next. And it's what usually happens once men get involved in things. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, thank you again that you are the creator. And thank you that the more we look and discover and, and, and investigate and explore what you have made, and when we do so with an open mind, that it just speaks so powerfully of your wisdom and power and that you are the creator, that you're the one who got all these things started and going, that they didn't just appear out of nowhere. But thank you that you're the, our great creator and that you're timeless and that you're still there and actively involved in our lives. We believe that. We know that. And at the right point in time, you sent the second person of the Trinity, your son, Jesus, to take on human flesh and to live that perfect life, a sinless life, to completely fulfill the law and to offer the perfect sacrifice for our sins. So that now all who look to him and place their faith and trust in him can have their sins forgiven and experience new life, new hope, and be a part of this fantastic future that you've given us. So again, Lord, thank you that you created us, you made us, our lives are in your hands. Even this next week is in your hands and you know what things we're going to face and you're at work even now providentially preparing things and preparing us for that. And so we don't have to worry. 
Uh, we just turn our worries into prayers and we let you do the worrying for us. And so uh, again, for all these things, we're very grateful. So thank you for this good morning. I pray you might dismiss us with your blessing. Of course, in your name we pray. Amen.